friends, Miss Danny from the Pleasant Hills Public Library, and I am so excited that you're here with me today for another installment of Steam Creatures. So, before we get into it, do you remember what Steam stands for? Hmm. Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math. And we will be using all of those subject areas today to learn a little bit more about deserts. So, what is a desert? A desert is defined as a place that gets less than 10 inches of rain in a whole year. So basically, very, very little rain. Most deserts are hot. And maybe when you hear the word desert, you think of sand or snakes, tarantulas, cactus. But deserts can also be very, very cold, like Antarctica. So let's take a moment to learn a little bit more about deserts, the animals that live there, and how they survive without much water. A desert is any large, dry area of land with little to no rain. Deserts can be found on every continent, and despite their harsh climates, are home to many varied plants, animals, and people. There are four main types of deserts, subtropical, coastal, rain shadow, and polar. Subtropical deserts, such as the Sahara Desert, are the hottest deserts as they're located along the equator. Coastal deserts, as you might have guessed, are located along the coastline and are often foggy and humid, but still dry. In fact, the Atacama Desert, which is a coastal desert, is the driest desert on Earth. Rain shadow deserts, such as the Gobi Desert, can be found where mountains block the cold air and rainfall from falling. Lastly, polar deserts, such as Antarctica, may be covered in ice but have very little to no rainfall. Animals have adapted to living in deserts in many different ways. Many desert animals are nocturnal and only come out in the cool evenings. Many animals dig deep burrows to hide underground and beat the heat. The fennec fox, seen here, dig large community burrows. They also have very large ears and light-colored coat that help them keep cool. Since rain is so scarce, many animals have developed other ways to get water. The thorny devil lizard, seen here, collects dew along its body. Its scales help collect and direct the water droplets right into its mouth. Camels do not store water in their humps like people once believed, but rather they store fat. And during a shortage of food and water, the camels draw nutrition and moisture from its fat-storing hump. As for the plants, they too have adapted to less water. Cactuses store large amounts of water within them and can survive with very little rain. Many also have shallow, wide-spreading roots that allow them to soak in every last drop. And now, friends, let's read an informative nonfiction book about deserts. I really like this book because it features lots of photographs of real people and real animals that call the desert their home. This is Discover Science Deserts, written by Nicola Davies and read today with permission from Macmillan Publishing. What is a desert? A desert is a place where it almost never rains. This makes deserts the driest places on Earth and the hardest to live. Almost one-fourth of the land on our planet is covered in deserts. Wherever there's a desert, there are animals and plants that have found a way to survive in the harsh, dry climate. Not all deserts are hot and sandy. They can be pebbly or cool, rocky, mountainous, or even a mixture of these. Every desert is unique. The hot Mojave Desert in North America was once the bottom of a lake, and now it is a huge plain covered in cracked, dried mud and pebbles. The Gobi Desert. The wind always blows from the same direction, and this shapes the sand dunes and pushes them forwards. The rocks are found in mountains that are part of the Sahara. They are high, but they are covered in frost in the winter. Fog blows in from the ocean next to the Nambid Desert. This brings water to some of the highest sand dunes in the world. Desert weather is extreme. 
Clear blue skies mean that deserts are almost always sunny and hot during the day, but at night it's a very different story. With no clouds to keep in the day's warmth, nights in the desert are very cold. Desert people light fires to stay warm after dark. It may be freezing at midnight, but by noon in the desert it is very hot. Animals such as the springbok have to shelter from the sun. Desert squirrels use their bushy tail to help them cope with the extreme weather. In the cold night, the tail is like a fluffy blanket, but during the hot day, it's the perfect sunshade. Deserts are so windy that almost everyone has a wind with its own special name. For example, the wind in Algeria is called Kashmir, and in North America, it is called the Chubasis. Sometimes desert winds pick up sand and dust and blow them around in storms that can last for days. This makes it difficult to see and even to breathe. Gusts full of sand and dust slowly wear away rocks. Over thousands of years, the rocks are transformed into strange shapes, such as these amazing formations in the Mojave Desert. Desert winds rub sand grains together, and this makes the grains smooth and round. So that's an extreme close-up of sand, microscopic level. Pretty cool. Rain in the desert is very rare. So when there are showers, desert plants and animals have to make the most of them. Heavy rain often follows thunder and lightning. In some deserts, storms bring rain every year, but other deserts can stay dry for more than 10 years. As soon as it rains, frogs lay their eggs in rainwater pools. Their tadpoles must grow quickly and change into frogs before the pool tries out. Desert plants flower after it rains, so the whole desert looks like a carpet of blossoms. When the flowers dry out and die, the le they leave seeds behind, and these seeds sprout the next time it rains. Desert plants are tough. They have thicker skin, smaller leaves, and more spines than other plants. And this stops the heat from drying them out and keeps the hungry animals away. Crisoto bushes from North America lose their leaves when it's dry, but when it rains, they grow them again. Leaves of this strange looking wishasha plant bend over onto the ground. The fog and dew stick to the leaves, making droplets of water then run down to the roots. It's a neat adaptation. The Sargoa cacti from Arizona has no leaves. Instead, they store water in their huge stems. These stems are protected by thick skins and many prickly spines. Only the tops of the stone plant's two fat leaves peak above the ground surface. The plant hides from the sun and drying winds until it rains, and only then is it able to flower. Flight makes desert life easier for birds because they can travel long distances to find food and water, but they still have to cope with the hot days and the cold nights. The tiny elf owl makes use of the cool twilight to hunt for small mammals, reptiles, and insects. It nests under the ground where its eggs are protected from the fierce heat that could easily cook their shells. Woodpeckers make holes in the rotten or broken stems of giant sagroa cacti. The bird nests in the cool holes and pecks away any sick parts of a cactus. This stops disease from spreading to the whole plant. Desert roadrunners warm up after the cold desert night by lifting their neck feathers and letting the sun shine on a patch of special skin. This skin soaks up heat and keeps them warm. Insects, reptiles, and rodents thrive in the desert because they don't need much water. They can also hide from the heat, wind, or cold in their burrows. Desert honey ants store precious water and nectar in their blown up bellies. This supply helps the ant colony survive when there is no food for water. Reptiles such as this chuckwalla stay under the ground in the cold of night and when morning comes, they lie in the sun to warm up. Darkling beetles find something to drink by tap trapping the droplets of water from fog on their legs and tipping the water towards their mouth. It's very clever. Animals such as this small gerbil are warm-blooded. They search for food in the cold night, but during the day they hide in underground burrows to stay cool.
Large mammals that live in deserts cannot shelter from the sun in burrows like their smaller relatives do, so they must find other ways to beat the heat. To cool their bellies, kangaroos scrape away at the hot surface sand and lie down on the cooler sand underneath. Fennec Fox's pale fur helps reflect the heat and keep them cool, just like a white t-shirt would help keep you cool on a hot summer day. At night, camels' bodies become very cold, so although the sun warms them all day, they're never too hot. Did you know that camels have two sets of eyelashes? so that when they're walking in the wind, they can protect their eyes from the sand. Pretty cool, huh? Rivers flowing through a desert or bubbling up from under the ground can bring water all year long to deserts. A place where this happens is called an oasis. Oasis are bustling with life. Tall trees such as palms and many types of animals can live in an oasis because there is plenty of water. Oasis are very important to desert people and their animals. They may travel hundreds of miles to find water at a familiar oasis, even if the water is at the bottom of a well. People have lived in deserts for thousands of years. They've learned all sorts of ways to cope with the difficulties of desert life. Many desert people are nomads. They live in tents and move around to find fresh water and grazing sites for their animals. Women in India's Thar Desert carry water from faraway wells in large jugs that they balance on top of their heads. That, my friends, is a very special skill. Deserts are important and beautiful wild places, but they are expanding unnaturally because some of the things that humans do Every year, growing deserts swallow up valuable grassland, farmland, and forests. Where people let their animals eat all the plants, the sun and the wind can hit the bare ground, and this turns the soil into dust and makes it difficult to regrow plants. Cars, airplanes, and factories emit gases that make the weather hotter, and this is called global warming. It is worse in places that are already hot and dry, so it makes the deserts grow. people can help stop deserts from expanding by planting trees and grass to protect the soil. Irrigating the desert helps keep the plants alive. Saving rainwater with dams means that there will be water for crops. This woman is harvesting food in what was once a desert. Usually water runs through sand and is lost. Adding flakes of special plastic to the water helps soil hold on to it and helps the plants grow. Growing plants also helps cool the ground and the air above. This means that the soil stays moist and the desert cannot expand. There are cities in deserts all over the world. But cities with millions of people use a lot of water and that's a big problem in any desert. Las Vegas, located in the desert in Nevada, is so big that it uses water from hundreds of miles away. This lack of water threatens both the wildlife and the farmland with drought. Abu Dhabi, on the coast of the United Arab Emirates, uses fresh water from the ocean by taking out the salt. This means that there's enough water to create green spaces that keep the city cool. Graz, an ancient city in the Sahara Desert, needs much less water than a modern town. People there carefully use water and know that every drop is precious. Deserts may look empty, but they have hidden treasures. They also give us the space to do things that are dangerous anywhere else. The world's deadliest weapons, nuclear bombs, were tested in deserts where they could not kill anyone. But these bombs left the land poisoned for many years after testing. Petroleum is found under some deserts. It's pumped and carried to cities and other countries in huge pipes like this one. Opals were formed millions of years ago when water drained from rocks under the ground. This ground is now in the Australian deserts, and almost all of the world's opals are mined there. It's very pretty. Lots of fun! Sunny blue skies and beautiful scenery make deserts great places to relax, but some people prefer a little more action. Sandboarding? Would you go sandboarding? I don't know. I think I would need goggles. 
You can go down a sand dune the same way that you can slide down a snowy slope. You can even surf a dune like a big wave in the ocean. Dune buggies can climb steep dunes and zoom around the desert without getting stuck in the sand. They're a lot of fun, but their tires can damage desert plants. Rock formations found in the desert are warm and dry, and this makes them easier to climb than mountains where the weather is cold, wet, and icy. We can learn about the past in deserts because the hot, dry air preserves dead bodies. Sand covers the dried remains of people, plants, and animals. And because few people live in the deserts, the remains can live undisturbed for a long time. Bodies buried in deserts dry out very quickly, so skin, hair, and clothes can last for thousands of years. Preserved dead bodies, called mummies, found in deserts show us how people looked and dressed a long time ago. Thousands of years ago, people painted pictures on rocks in the Nabib. They show that the desert used to be grassland bustling with people and animals. Some of the world's most exciting dinosaur fossils have been found in the desert. The dry winds wear away rocks and bring fossil bones close to the surface. But not all deserts are hot and dusty. Some are found in the coldest parts of the world. The word desert can be used to describe places where conditions are simply too tough for life to survive. There could be no life in the ocean without photoplankton. In places where plankton does not grow, the ocean can be a wet and salty desert. Some parts of the Arctic receive less rain than Africa's Sahara Desert. These areas are too cold and dry for anything to grow. Polar bears survive by walking to the ocean and catching seals. Do you think you could survive in the desert? It has been very hot here lately in Pittsburgh, but nothing compared to as hot as it can get in the hot deserts. Some deserts can get up to 150 degrees in the day. Can you imagine? Whew, I think I'm gonna need a fan. And now friends, it is time for our steam experiment. We have steam kits available in our lobby for pickup while supplies last. So stop by, grab one, and then come on in to say hi. Let's head over to the craft table to learn a little bit more about what's in our kit and how to do our experiment about cactuses. Included in your STEM kit is a desert word search slash crossword puzzle, addition slash subtraction game sheet, a paper clip to use with that game, two paper cups, five toothpicks, two sponge strips, and a piece of wax paper. So let's start our experiment. For our first experiment, you're also going to need some water, a tray, and possibly also tape. And if you would like to do the optional experiment, you're also going to need a flashlight. So for in this experiment, our sponges are going to represent the cactuses. We're going to start by wrapping one cactus in wax paper. So get your wax paper out. You might have a bigger piece than you need, and if that's the case, feel free to cut it down. We're gonna wrap it. I need to cut mine. Let's go get some scissors. Once your sponge is wrapped in the wax paper, you can secure it with a little piece of tape, or, and this part's kind of fun, you can take the toothpicks and poke them through the wax paper and the sponge. It's also a little tricky, so make sure to use your muscles. Are you ready? If you're going to be doing the optional experiment to figure out why the spines on a cactus might help keep it cool, you're going to need a flashlight. So let's take a closer look to see if we can figure out the purpose of those spines. As you move the flashlight around, what do you observe? Hopefully shadows. So spines on a cactus create shadows to help it stay cool. For the next part of the experiment, we're going to take our water and fill up both cups about a quarter full. And it's okay if you get a little bit more in, it won't hurt anything. Next, take both of your cactus sponges and put one in each cup. 
For your one that's covered in wax paper, make sure that the bottom is completely exposed. So you might need to fold up the wax paper, or in my case, remove those lower level spines so that it fits inside the cup. And now we wait. As you wait, observe your sponges and see if you can figure out what they're doing. Once your sponges have completely filled with water, and this may take a while, so be patient, gently remove them from the cups and set them on your tray. For the wax covered one, make sure that that wax paper stays on and is covering as much of the sponge as possible. For the next part of our experiment, we're going to put our sponges somewhere sunny and dry, and we're going to watch them. Check back after an hour, maybe two hours, three, or just the next day. So let's see what happens after an hour. So it's been 24 hours, and both sponges are still pretty wet. Our non one, you can hear it, and our wax covered one. Oh, well, the wax covered one is definitely wetter. They feel about the same right now because they both have water, but let's check back again in another 24 hours. Well, friends, it has now been 48 hours since we started this experiment. Let's check our sponges that, again, are representing cacti to see how they're doing with retaining water. We have our plain sponge. Mm, it's still a little moist. You can see a couple droplets, but it's actually fairly dry considering. Ooh, this one feels heavy. Let's see how much water comes out of this one. Oh my, that one kept a lot of water. So. How do you think the wax paper helped? The wax paper around the one sponge represents the wax coating found on cactuses. And as we can see, it helps retain the water by letting less water evaporate. Pretty neat. Did you enjoy this experiment? I hope so. We would love to hear from you and see pictures of you doing this experiment. Feel free to send a picture to pleasanthills at enetwork.net or post it to our special Facebook group, Pleasant Hills Library Virtual Programming. Well, that's all for this week, friends. Join us next week when we learn about insects. Woo. Until then, stay safe, and I hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye.